on today's Alsa UUM laid back legal video, I'm going to share with you a little bit of my experience within NGOs and grassroots communities regarding migrant labor and its implications in Malaysia. I'm also going to share with you a little bit of the legal framework, its enactment and how it works within the country as easily as I can. So for that, I've broken it down into five little topics and we will go through them one by one. So let's look at the first one, terminology. What I really want to talk about is documented and undocumented migrants. Documented migrants are those who have their papers to be where they are, which means when a police stops them or somebody in uniform stops them and says, hey, do you have the papers to be here? And then they say, yes, I do. These are my passport, these are my permit, these are etc, etc, etc. Now, for undocumented workers, they often come into a situation where they don't have the paper qualification to be in the land. So for example, their permit may have expired, their passport expired, no one has renewed it, situations like that. Now, this is not interchangeably used as them being illegal. I know this is a very common debate, people talk about this very, very often. But personally, or if you read enough articles, you will understand that no one's illegal because we're all born with intrinsic human rights. We all have a right to live, a right to a family, and a lot more other rights. So similarly, migrants who come to any country, whether here or us going elsewhere, they are all legal just the same. It's just a matter of administration whether they have papers or not. So the better way to describe migrants who don't have papers is to say that they are undocumented migrants. Number two, why are they so important? Why are there so many of them? But before I get into that, let me tell you a bunch of numbers. The Department of Statistics in Malaysia back in April 2020 came out with a bunch of figures that said the Malaysian population is 32.73 million. The labor force, 15.71 million. So how much of that are migrant laborers? 1,975,879 of them. 1 million, close to 2 million actually. That's so many people that come here. So the reason they are so important is because back when industrialization was happening in the country, you're looking from about 1970s, there was so much work that needed to be done, but domestically, we didn't have enough people helping us out. So we had to source it from the outside, which is why we started bringing in so many foreign labor into us. And which is why now you have 2 million people helping us out. Number three, the legal framework. Now, I won't go into too much detail, but in essence, for you to understand, is that when migrant workers come to Malaysia, in addition to all the immigration requirements that they have to comply with for them to stay here as documented workers, they are also covered under the employment laws. Now, if you're in the domestic line, so for example, the lovely kakak that you probably would have met in your friend's house, your neighbor's house, your cousin's house, they are often not, not protected under the employment law simply because they don't fall under the definition of what employee means. They are not considered workmen in that essence because they are helpers at home. Okay, I'm going to come back to that later, but for now, this is what you're looking at. Also, of course, Malaysia has ratified a number of international conventions. This pressures the, the government of the country to ensure that no matter who comes in our land, it's all protected, safe and accounted for. So number four. So let's talk about the enforcement of these laws. Now, I've already explained that all of us, including the migrant workers, are also covered under the Employment Act. However, if you are working in the domestic line, so for example, you're a helper in someone's house, you may not be considered an employee under the Employment Act. So that's interesting because it shows you that despite having some laws, they don't cover everything. So if you're a domestic helper, you may not be protected under these laws if something happens to you, whether you're foreign or you're here. Similarly, migrant workers who are protected under the Employment Act may not get the kind of protection that they need simply because they go from documented to undocumented. So this is why terminology is really, really important. Migrant laborers come into the country more often than not perfectly documented. They have all the paperwork, they come in the right way or the way that they ought to come in. Now, they come here and then they go through a series of misfortunate events that makes them undocumented. You're looking at things like trafficking, smuggling, um, contract substitution, exploitation, the works. So it's not that it's their fault. Sometimes the system is such that they're caught in a bad place in a situation they can't get out of and they become undocumented and therefore not warranted any protection under existing laws. And number five. Moving forward, so now we've looked at a bunch of things. We look at terminology, we look at why they're important, we look at the laws and their enforcement. So the real question is, are these laws sufficient? Now, there's no one all answer to it. Essentially, you have a system and you have laws, all countries do. The question is, are they enough? 
More often than not, what happens is it just doesn't cover enough ground. So what we got to do is to sit and think and wonder like, okay, we have laws A, B, C and D. Are they enough? Are they covering the problems? And when there is a problem, what are the mechanisms that come with it? So what about situations where migrant workers come into the country documented and they become undocumented? In that period when they become undocumented, what can they do? Where can they go to find redress? Or what about situations like domestic workers? Now, this is a little bit interesting because I had attended a talk once a long time ago and the idea of that talk was to kind of change the narrative of how we call them. So instead of calling them maids or just helpers, we use the term domestic workers. That way, we enforce the idea that they're not just helpers to a family, but actual workers who do work from a certain period of time and contribute to the family in that sense. So it's really interesting to note that sometimes it's not just having a legal framework but practical solutions and how you can enforce this within the country.